so today we're going to start chapter three. So chapter three is the Boltzmann distribution and the Helmholtz free energy. You know, both of these things are um, building blocks of, of uh, statistical mechanics. Okay, so we have been looking at systems in which, at closed systems, in which the two subsystems are more or less the same size. And, you know, from these we derived the concepts of um, thermal equilibrium, thermal contact. So, most systems um, are not closed systems, they are open systems. And, you know, that means that there's some energy uh, that is more or less unlimited, right? That can flow into your system or, or go out. So we're going to use uh, similar concepts. So this is the reservoir, script R. And the, over here, we're going to have uh, system. So now there is less problem with using systems, subsystems. There's just a reservoir and the system that we are interested in. The system is um, S, you know, script S. So if this system has energy E, then this system, the reservoir, is going to have energy. Uh, U naught minus E. So it can uh, transfer energy to this system. And this is not drawn to scale. The reservoir for all practical purposes, uh, you know, it's, it's infinite. It's much bigger than the system S. So let's consider a system that has only two energy levels, E2 and E1. And this is the lower energy level. The system can get energy from the reservoir to move from E1 to E2, and it can give energy back to the reservoir to move from E2 to E1. And to the reservoir, this is a negligible amount of energy. But the cool thing about it is that we do not really have to look at these energy in the small system. We can look at the reservoir, um, see how much energy it has. And from that, we can calculate how much energy the system has. So the probability that the state is E1, that the system is in the state with energy E1 is going to be um, you know, some normalization factor times the multiplicity. And this is the multiplicity of the reservoir. U naught minus E1. Mm. Yeah. 
the probability that it is in state with energy E2, you know, you have the same normalization factor. So we can get rid of the normalization factors. So is the multiplicity of the reservoir when it has energy U naught, U naught minus uh, E2. And this is equation from Kittel and Cromer 3.2. So chapter three, equation two. Okay, so let's do a little bit of math over here. Very simple math. We have this uh, ratio over here, the ratio of the probabilities. So what we're gonna do is we're going to do the exponent um, of the natural log of that ratio. Okay, and of course, the natural log of a ratio, you can do it as is equal to that. It's a uh, identity. So we're going to have the natural log operating on each of them. And the natural log of the multiplicity is the entropy. So then this is equal to exponent and natural log of gr minus natural log of the multiplicity of the reservoir when it is in this other energy state. So again, this is just the entropy. So is the entropy of the reservoir in the two states. So then we can define this quantity change in the entropy of the reservoir as this one minus this one, right? It's just a change in entropy. So that means that the ratio of the probabilities is equal to E to the change in the entropy of the reservoir. Uh, this one is equation 3.5. Okay, so we're going to consider this one uh, again. Let's see if this works. Works. So the Taylor expansion of X naught plus A is gonna be this. X 
x equals six zero. It's actually two factorial, but it's the same as one half. A square, and then this is the second derivative of the function, also at x equals six nine. Plus, you know, everything else. So we can Taylor expand. The entropy is going to be the entropy um, of the reservoir at you not. Mm, let me write this in a little. Okay, so we have this one plus everything else. And the other part was the negative entropy. So we can do the same thing here. We have the negative. So this one is negative. This one is positive. This one is negative. Okay, so uh, this one is going to go away with this one. Uh, this is the definition of one over tau, the derivative of the entropy with respect to the energy. And so that means that the delta Uh, sigma of the reservoir, so the change in entropy of the reservoir is going to be equal to minus E1 divided by the temperature and then plus E2 divided by the temperature. And we can put these ones in there. Mm, actually, I'm not gonna put them in there yet. So if you look at this derivative, the second derivative, um, this is the derivative with respect to the energy of the derivative of the entropy with respect to the energy. And so this of course is the inverse of tau, the temperature. So 
the energy is an extensive quantity. The bigger your system, the more energy you have. There are other quantities that are extensive. For example, the volume. And the bigger your system, the more volume you have. Um, the number of particles, you know, the more particles you have, the bigger your system. But there are other quantities that are intensive. So they are divided by the total amount in your, in your system. So the temperature is an intensive quantity. Uh, it doesn't matter how big or how small your system is, you know, it has only one temperature. The temperature doesn't depend on whether it is big or small. And it makes sense because the temperature is the average kinetic energy. Um, the pressure, you know, it's another uh, quantity that is intensive. And so here, the, the reservoir can become as big as, as you want, arbitrarily big. Uh, but the temperature is not going to change much. So in the limit, you know, of very large U, this is equal to zero. And it is the same for both of them. So that means that we can ignore them. We can forget about them. And higher order terms, so third order, fourth order, uh, they're going to be even smaller. So the only one that matters is the first order in which you have um, extensive and extensive, and that's why you get the intensive. Okay, so then this is it. And we can rewrite this as negative E1 minus E2 divided by the temperature. And remember that this is the temperature of the reservoir. It is going to be the same as the temperature of your system because, because they are in, in, uh, in thermal equilibrium, but um, you control the temperature of the reservoir. And these energy states are the energy states of, of your system, you know, the two energy states that you have. So this relates the temperature of the reservoir, or you can call it your know, environment. You know, my environment right now is, I don't know, uh, 70 Fahrenheit or something, and pretty much everything in here is about the same temperature. So you know, the environment is the reservoir and these are the, the energy levels of your system. Okay, so I'm gonna put it over here. So if you uh, get the, the ratio, of the probabilities. Then it's going to be exponent the of minus E1 over tau divided by exponent of minus E2 over tau. This equation in Kittel and Cromer is equation 3.9. This is a pretty important um, development, you know, in 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 statistical mechanics. It's called the Boltzmann factor. And if you take only one of these, so exponent of 
negative e divided by t. This little guy is called the Boltzmann, you guessed it. Boltzmann distribution. So I guess this guy Boltzmann was pretty busy at the end of the 19th century or so. So we have the Boltzmann uh, constant, the Boltzmann factor and the Boltzmann distribution. Okay, so yeah, uh, the two probabilities, this is the ratio of the probability of finding the system in quantum state one to the probability of finding it in quantum state two. And it is a function of the temperature of the reservoir. Okay, so let's take a look at how this equation behaves, what it does. So when we had a closed system, the fundamental assumption is that every state is equally likely. In an open system, the distribution is going to have this form. So, the energy levels, the lower energy levels have a higher probability of being occupied than the, wait, sorry, what did I say? The lower energy levels have a higher probability of being occupied than the higher energy levels. So pretty important difference between open and closed systems. So we have our Boltzmann distribution. If we let tau be equal to one, we just remove it from there. Then the probability Is going to be proportional to e to the negative e. And let's say that this is the energy of some state s. So then the probability of getting that, of getting the state of that energy is going to be equal to this. And this is of course equal to 1 over e to the e. Okay, so I'm gonna leave that over there. I'm going to, let's plot it. This is your energy. This is your probability. How does it look like? It's falling. Kind of like that? Yeah, well, I think we're more like round in a circle. Mm -hmm. 
What do you mean? Okay, I can try. So, like that? Okay, good, good, good. So this is e to the negative um, es. Okay, so what happens if the temperature is not quite zero, but tends to zero? Well, then we have e to the minus es divided by zero. So this is um, infinity, right? You divide something by zero. So one over, because you have the negative in there, e to the infinity. So if that is infinity, one over infinity is equal to zero. How is that going to look like? Well, you cannot really get exactly to zero, but it's going to be, you're gonna have some value over here and it's gonna be pretty much zero everywhere else. Okay. Uh, the probability has to be one. So this will be kind of like a delta function and then zero everywhere. The other limiting case, of course, is the temperature goes to infinity. If the temperature goes to infinity, then you have infinity over here. So then this is something divided by infinity. It's gonna be zero. And this is equal to one, one divided by one, well, that's one. So that one is just gonna be one everywhere. Okay, so this is uh, tau goes to infinity. And this one is gonna be tau goes to zero. Okay, so what this is telling you is that if the temperature is zero, there is only one state in which your system can be, and that is the energy, that is the state of, of the lowest energy, which makes sense, right? If there's, no, if there's no temperature to move your system into other states, you can only be in the ground state, so this will be absolute zero. If you have an infinite temperature or you know, a very high temperature, that means that your probability of being in any state is the same or very close to the same, right? It's not gonna be exactly, but it's gonna go down a little bit. And in between, you're going to have these uh, decreasing exponential. It looks like this. So at some temperature, let's say, let's call it normal temperature, the probability of having lower states, your system being in a lower state is higher than the probability being of it being in a, in a high energy state. Does, does this make sense or no? This is the same probability density function you know, that we were dealing with uh, before. It's normalized, it has all the same properties, except that it looks different. It's um, much heavier on the lower energy side. Okay, so, and yeah, remember that the sum of all the probabilities must be equal to one. That will be the zeroth moment. So, How do we normalize these, this system, this probability? 
Well, this is a quantum system. You know, we here we're drawing it as a continuum, but it's actually discrete levels that are really close together. So then it's going to be the sum over all the states of the exponent of the well, negative of the energy in that state divided by the temperature. This equation has a name and a symbol. The symbol is Z and Z is a function of tau, the temperature. And it is called the partition function. The Z stands for, hmm, I don't remember how to pronounce this. Sustansume, something like that. Someone here speaks German? No? Yes? It means, um, yes, I hear something. Sorry, I said no. Oh, <laughs> I didn't hear that part. It just means um, sum over states. So you're summing over all the states. Uh, this partition function, it actually comes up in uh, in many fields, not just in in statistical mechanics, but you know if you're doing um, machine learning, a lot of your issues come from calculating the partition function. So in this case, it's easy. You know we we know what is the energy of each state, so we can just sum everything. Uh, this is equation. 3.10. So the, the partition function is the proportionality constant between the Boltzmann factor and the probability. And so before we just had the ratio in order to get rid of the proportionality constant, but The probability is going to be, um, you know, of, of state S exponent of the energy of state S divided by the temperature divided by the partition function, which is the sum of all the possible states. So also. We can take the zeroth moment. So we add all the probabilities. That's going to be equal to one over the partition function sum of uh, the probabilities of all the states. And that is equal to e to the minus es over tau. And this is the definition of the partition function. So the partition function um, normalizes the sum of the Boltzmann, uh, uh, normalizes the Boltzmann uh, distribution. Okay. So the partition function is very useful. So this is one of the potential uses that we have for it. If we take the first moment, so the mean of the energy, 
from the definition, right, of a moment, we will have E, then the uh, S probability of E S, and the sum is over all the states. So the average energy, you know, especially if you have a, a large system, the average energy is just the energy of the system since the fluctuations are going to be so tiny. So it's gonna be the sum over all the states, e to the s, I mean, e of s, energy of state s. And then we have that stuff, right? And we're going to divide that by the partition function. So there are um, some cool mathematical tricks. If you take the derivative with respect to tau of the partition function, which is a function of tau, then you have the derivative with respect to tau of the sum over all the states of e to the negative energy of the state over tau. And of course, this is operating on each uh, sum and um, independently. So we can put the derivative inside and the sum outside. So let u be the negative es over tau. So then the derivative of u is going to be uh, plus e energy of state s tau squared, right? So just the derivative of this one. So then this will be the derivative of u. So we can, this is gonna be equal to the sum over all the states Es divided by tau squared e to the negative Es over tau. And we can take this one over tau outside because it's not part of the sum. Right. So then this remember is the derivative of the partition function with respect to tau. So we can put the tau squared over here. So it's equal to that. And um, this is equal to the partition function. So we can put it over here. This was equal to the um, energy. This is the logarithmic derivative. So this is tau squared derivative of the natural log of the partition function 
with respect to tau. So the energy of the system is equal to that. This essentially means that if you know the partition function, you know the energy of the system. The energy of the system is a macroscopic quantity. The temperature is also a macroscopic quantity, but the partition function, it's a microscopic quantity. So it tells you about the energy levels of the system. So you can relate uh, macroscopic and microscopic quantities using the partition function. So by measuring, um, you know, if, if you knew the, the partition function microscopic, you can derive OB the, the macroscopic quantities and vice versa, which is probably more important. So this one, is um, equation 3.12 in Kittel and Cromer. Okay, so we're making some progress here. We're going, we're going to now look at reversible processes. This is page 64 in Kittel and Cromer. Okay. What is a reversible process? We talked about irreversible processes before. We said that irreversibility produces the arrow of time. So what is a reversible process? No idea? Some guesses? And the entropy can the entropy of the system can get back to where it was original. Yes. How will it do that? Mm, not really. You know, once you once you bring another system, that is going to increase the entropy, and so it makes it non-reversible or irreversible. But you are on the on the right track. So, you know, if you remember, we mentioned that the change in entropy. This is the, the second law of thermodynamics is greater than or equal to zero. If the change of entropy is zero, so there is no change of entropy, then you can go back and forth. You know, in practice, this is going to be very, very tough, but not impossible actually. So you know, it's just when you have a, a lot of atoms, um, you know, big systems that are in equilibrium, you pretty much cannot avoid these. But if you have a smaller system that you have good control over, then you might be able to move um, along the line of change of entropy equals zero. That would be a reversible process. Uh, if you think about it, in your mechanics class, for example, 
you never mention the entropy. Um, and that is not quite an omission. Uh, it's simply that in, in mechanics, classical mechanics, uh, you assume that the change in entropy is always zero. And that is why, you know, the, uh, the laws of mechanics are reversible, right? Like you, can, you can propagate your particle according to Newton's laws, second law, forward in time or backward in time, it doesn't matter because you don't change the entropy. And you don't change the entropy because um, in classical mechanics, you don't really distinguish you know, the, the discreteness uh, of, of, of matter. You, you think that is, well, you assume that it's continuous. So that's why all, all the processes in, uh, in mechanics are reversible. Uh, obviously in, not so in thermal uh, dynamics. So let's consider this system. It's a particle in a box. Have you seen it in your classes like um, modern physics or quantum? Yes or no? Yes. Good. So the particle in a box is small enough, and you have one particle, uh, that you can uh, squeeze the box very slowly. You have to be gentle. But if you squeeze the box, uh, you can increase uh, its, its, its energy, right? So it's gonna be the, the temperature without moving away from the same quantum state. So we're going to look you know, in detail at, at the particle in a box, um, maybe next class, and if not the, cl the class after that. But what it's, uh, the only thing that you need to know for, for, for purposes of this example is that the, the states are given by this equation. So um, over here, well, I'm gonna move it a little bit. This is equal to n squared. Mm. So I'm gonna put n squared over here. And actually, I'm gonna draw the lines first. So this plot, yeah, this is figure 3.5 from Kittel and Cromer. So it looks, let's see, it's kind of like this. Kind of like that. On the vertical axis, you have the energy. Uh, so zero, five, 10, and 15. This is relative energy, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, what, well, there's no units. And the volume is over here. And 1.0 is here. 0 0.5 is here. Zero is here. So here you're compressing in this direction and you are expanding in this direction. Okay. So uh, this, this is a line that corresponds to n squared. This, well, this sum equals three. It's going to be six, nine, 11, 12, 14. 17, 18, 19, and 21. 
and they also give you the multiplicity of that state. So the multiplicity of this one is one, this is one, three, 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 one, six, three, 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 six. And just for illustration purposes, this is gonna be all the n's, n x and y and n z are equal to one. There's only one way to do this. And n squared, the sum is equal to three. One squared plus, plus one squared plus one squared. Uh, for the next one, you're gonna have these possibilities. And so on, right? This one is two, two, two. Again, there's only one way of doing that. So the multiplicities correspond to uh, the different uh, states. A state is described just by this sum. Okay, so if you grab your your box in which you have your particle and you just smash it, do you think that you're going to change the quantum state of the of the particle? Probably. So let's say that you put. Um, bottle of water or juice, you put it, uh, you know, you're, you're driving your car and you put it on the passenger side on the, um, on the floor of the car and it's standing up, you know, the, this, this um, bottle of water. If you accelerate very quickly, you know, if you move the car very quickly, what is going to happen to that, to that bottle? What do you have to do for the water bottle to not fall while you're moving? Just like super slowly, right? So that is called the adiabatic approximation when you assume that you're moving, you're changing the system so slowly that, that it doesn't change its state. You know, you're still moving, you're still moving that, that water bottle or juice, but it is not changing its position relative to the car. So I like this line number 12. Let's say that you start at volume equals one you can compress it, the energy is gonna go up, but you're going to remain on this line, right? This is the line that describes the energy volume relationship of this quantum state. Then you can move back. This will be a reversible process. You don't change the entropy. You can even you know, expand the system and go back, okay? If you're really careful, you can do this. This will be a reversible process. You do it fast or you do it in a careless way, you change the quantum state of the particle and you change the entropy because it's gonna move from here to here or you know, from here to here. So it's gonna be a, it's gonna be, uh, a mess. Okay, so. So the nx, ny, and nz are the positions of the particle, right? They're not positions. Um, we will see them later. 
So essentially you have uh, sine waves. So they look like that, or they look like that, or they look like this. Oops. And this is the wave function of the particle. So quantum mechanics tells you that it has to be a, an integer. And it comes from this. So these numbers, we, we will see them you know, soon enough. These numbers describe which states the, the wave function of the particle can occupy or can have. You know, for the purposes that were, and this is three dimensional, so and that's why it is a box. Um, so what we're saying here, you know, we have our, this is a three, dimen three dimensional box. Let's say that you have you have that wave function. You can squeeze this box slowly or expand it slowly, and the wave function, you know, is gonna the length is going to change, but it is going to remain, you know, with the same number of zeros. That's another way in which you can describe the wave function by the number of zeros. But this is three dimensional. So you have a wave function uh, in the x direction, another one in the y direction, and another one in the z direction coming out. OK, so a volume change that leaves the system in the same quantum state, so from here to here, it's called isentropic. So Entropic, that's the entropy, ice, um, isen, hmm. I think it's just the I, which is a Greek letter for self. So uh, the Greek word. So it means that the entropy remains the same, isentropic. So a isentropic reversible process implies that the process is a adiabatic. Adiabatic means that there is no heat transfer. If you add heat to this system, you will want to move to a higher energy. And you're going to change, you change the wave function or the quantum state, uh, the process is not reversible anymore. OK, so let's look at some stuff that has to do with this. So to first order, the change in the energy of state S right so after a reversible volume change is the energy of state S. Um, at V minus the change in V. So it could, it could go up, it could go down. So this is equal to the energy at the original volume minus the derivative of the um, energy with respect to the volume, which is just a slope times the change in the volume. This is equation 3.21. So you squeeze the box isotropically. Uh, if you do that, you're going to do uh, work on the box. Uh, we are assuming that the, the squeeze is Isotropic, so it is the same in, in every direction, in x, in, in y, and in z. 
So the change in energy is going to be the energy, the initial volume, minus the change in the volume. And this is a delta, so you have to subtract the original one. Okay, and this is going to be equal to minus that slope times delta v. And this is because um, the work that you do. Uh, it is adiabatic, so the work that you do on the box, it just goes directly to the to the internal energy. There's no other place for the uh, for the work to go to. So this one is equation three point twenty two. So the change in the volume. And this notation is not the, the, the best, but it's understandable. It's the area. And then you have the different um, changes. The deltas in, in the three orthogonal directions. And this is isotropic. So the change in X is equal to the change in Y. And that's equal to the change in Z. So the pressure oops, this is how I uh, write pressure you know compare that to probability so pressure is force divided by area we know that that means that the force is the pressure times the area so the force, um, if we multiply it times the changes, so delta x, delta y, delta z, um, and you do the same thing over here, delta x, delta y, and delta z, then you end up with uh, force times displacement. What is that? Work. work. And since uh, this is an adiabatic process, that is also equal to the change in the internal energy. And what is area times this displacement? Yeah, the change in volume. Okay, good. Uh, this is the pressure, you know, of state S. We are still along one of those states. So then um, we can compare it. Right? We have the um, delta U over here. So that's negative the energy with respect to the volume times delta V, right? And so we can get rid of, mm, I'm missing something. Mm -hmm. We have oh yeah, this is of course delta u. So we can just put it in there. And then the we can get rid of the delta v and 
we derive the pressure is equal to this minus derivative of ES with respect to the volume. Um, more generally, you know, if we take the, um, the average over all the states, then we get the average over here. And as I mentioned, the expectation value, the mean of the energies of all the states is going to be the, the energy of the system. And then this is going to be the pressure, the expectation value of the whole system. So we can get rid of the uh, subscript S. And more appropriately, because these are going to be a function of several variables, which we'll write it as negative change uh, derivative of the energy with respect to the volume. Okay, this is equation 3.26. So pretty cool, we just introduced a new thermodynamic variable. Um, oh, and this is at constant entropy, it's isentropic. Mm. Okay, let's see if I can hurry up. So the derivative of the entropy, the entropy is a function of the energy and the volume. It's gonna be the partial derivative of the entropy with respect to the energy at constant volume, du plus the derivative of the entropy with respect to the volume at constant energy, VV. Uh, this is just you know, from, the, uh, from the definition of the uh, differential. So if this is an isentropic process, then this whole thing is equal to zero. So uh, this is going to be approximately equal to the derivative of sigma with respect to u, constant volume. This is going to be uh, kind of like a delta u, you know, small change when the entropy is constant plus the derivative of the entropy with respect to V constant U and delta small change in V at uh, constant entropy equals to zero. If we divide everything by delta V, And this one is equal to one, right? So we can get rid of it. Uh, this one is still equal to zero. And this one is the partial derivative of u with respect to the volume at constant entropy. Okay, still equal to zero. And uh, this guy over here, 
the derivative of the entropy with respect to the energy is equal to one over tau. Right, so and that means that the derivative of the energy with respect to the volume at constant entropy is equal to minus tau. So we're gonna move this one over here, and this one over here, minus tau derivative of sigma with respect to the volume at constant u. This is equation 3.32. So this guy over here is the pressure actually negative pressure negative of the pressure so we can get rid of the negatives okay and we have the pressure as a function of the entropy, the volume, and the temperature at constant energy, okay? And can you give me like another six minutes? Yes? Thank you. Okay, so... I have to hurry up with this one. So the thermodynamic identity So we again have the derivative of the entropy function of the energy and volume so this is equal to the derivative of sigma with respect to u constant volume uh, du and the derivative of sigma with respect to v constant u dv. We saw that this one is equal to one over tau. And this one is equal to pressure over tau. Okay, so then we can rewrite this as um, well, we can rewrite it as one over tau du plus pdv. We can move the tau over here, so it will be tau derivative of sigma equals du plus p dv. This is equation 3.34a, and I'm pretty sure you have seen it before. This is the heat that you add to the system. This is the work that you do on the system or the system does on you, it depends. And this is the change in the internal energy of the system. Okay. So uh, this is very useful. Let me show you some, some stuff here. Um, we have tau, d sigma equals du plus p dv. 
Okay, so if we take the derivative of sigma with respect to u at constant volume, and we can get the derivative of sigma here, we move the tau over here. There's going to be one over tau uh, derivative of u with respect to u at constant volume. And this is at constant volume, so the dv is equal to zero. And this is equal to one. So if you take the derivative of the entropy with respect to the energy, you get one over tau. We knew that. What if we take the derivative of the entropy with respect to the volume at constant u? Then you get the tau, you move it over here. The du is going to be equal to 0. Derivative of b, v with respect to v at constant energy. This is equal to 1. Okay. So you get this relationship. OK, so let's switch it. We move the du over here. Now, I guess we move the PDV over here. I'm going to do the same thing. Derivative of u with respect to sigma at constant volume. It's going to be equal to this one is zero because the volume is constant. So we just have tau derivative of sigma with respect to sigma at constant volume. This is equal to one. So we get this relationship derivative of u with respect to the volume constant sigma, constant sigma. So this term is equal to zero. We have the negative p, uh, derivative of the volume, derivative of the volume at constant sigma. This is equal to one. So you get the pressure. Negative pressure is equal to this. And finally, I'll let you go. If we rearrange it again, we do PDV is equal to tau d sigma minus du. OK, so let's do the same thing. It's going to be the derivative of the volume with respect to sigma at constant u. Uh, yeah, sigma. going to be tau. This pressure, we move it over here. And then we have the derivative of sigma with respect to sigma, constant energy is equal to 1. This is at constant energy, so that is equal to 0. So this is the derivative um, of volume with respect to sigma. The derivative of volume with respect to u at constant sigma you have the negative, you move the, uh, the pressure as uh, so a constant sigma. So this one is equal to zero. And here you have the derivative of u with respect to u at constant sigma. This is equal to one. So this is equal to one um, negative of one over the pressure. Okay, so as you can see, this innocent looking thermodynamic identity tells you all the relationships. Between thermodynamic 
variables. Okay. Um, this last part with the derivations is not in the book, but uh, there is a section on the thermodynamic identity in which you see these. Um, well, with the TD sigma on the other side. All right, thank you. I'm gonna st stop recording.